Finals SAQ 36, Tyrodectomy. A. Which investigations are specifically indicated in the pre-op assessment of a patient presenting for tyrodectomy for treated tyrotoxicosis? This includes blood tests, which includes thyroid function tests, confirm that the patient is U-thyroid, elective surgery only when the patient is U-thyroid. Subclinical hypothyroidism usually presents with no anesthetic problems and no delay is needed. Full blood count, as carbimazole and PTU can cause agranulocytosis. Two group and safe samples as there is potential for blood loss. Serum calcium levels as it may drop post-op due to loss of parathyroid glands. Serum urea electrolytes and creatinine as hypo and hyperthyroidism affect kidney function. ECG. This should show normal rate if you thyroid. Patient may be bradycardic if ongoing beta blocker use. Atrial fibrillation may be detected if hyperthyroid. Chest X-ray or lateral thoracic inlet film. This may indicate tracheal deviation or narrowing or retrosternal extension. Plain radiographs overestimate diameters. Hence cannot be relied upon when predicting endotracheal tube diameter and length. CT scan to assess for retrosternal extension of coiter and tracheal compression. CT scan accurately delineates the site and degree of airway encroachment or intraluminal spread. CT scan is advisable if there are symptoms of narrowing such as stridor and positional breathlessness or there is more than 50% narrowing of airway on the radiograph. If infiltrating carcinoma, this may make neck movement difficult, leading to difficult intubation. SVC obstruction may be identified. Fiber optic nasal endoscopy. If concerns about likely ease of visualization of larynx at laryngoscopy, ENT consultation to document cord function for medical legal purposes is not routine unless an abnormality is likely, such as previous surgery or malignancy. Nasal endoscopy also defines any possible laryngeal displacement and is useful in airway planning. Consider tests for autoimmune disorders. B. What particular issues must the anesthetist consider during induction, maintenance and extubation for a uthyroid patient having total thyroidectomy? Induction. Airway plan. Majority of cases are straightforward and enable straightforward intubation even when there is some tracheal deviation or compression. A reinforced ETT will negotiate most distorted tracheas and permit optimal head positioning. Tracheal compression by a benign goiter will often accommodate an ETT beyond the predicted size as the gland is soft. Pre-oxygenation should be followed by IV induction and a neuromuscular blocker. There is possibility of deterioration due to tracheal compression on lying flat if the goiter is large. This should have been elicited in a pre-op questioning and investigations, head up tilt for induction, and consider need for a smaller diameter ETT. There is possibility of slower than usual intubation. If difficult intubation and therefore this leads to potential hypoxia, hence the need for pre-oxygenation, and consider the use of high-flow nasal oxygen. As this is a shared airway with the surgeon, use armored tube. The following features should lead to a more considered approach and may require discussion with the surgeon and radiologist. Malignancy. Cop palsies are likely. Distortion and rigidity of surrounding structures with possibility of intraluminal spread and displacement of the larynx increases the difficulty of intubation. The tumour can obstruct the airway anywhere from the glottis to the carina. If there are significant respiratory symptoms, and coexisting predictors of difficult intubation, straightforward intubation may not be possible. Hence, the full difficult airway kit should be ready, and other options to secure the airway for complicated thyroid surgery includes inhalational induction, fiber optic intubation, supraglottic airway device, tracheostomy, rigid bronchoscopy, and cricothyroidotomy. Inhalational induction with sevoflurin in patients with stridor and a suspected difficult upper airway is an option to secure the airway. However, stridor and reduced minute ventilation delays the onset of sufficiently deep anesthesia for intubation. Topical local anesthetic may be useful. For fiber optic intubation, attempts to pass a fiber optic bronchoscope in an awake patient with stridor is difficult. 
as the narrowed airway may become obstructed by the instrument. Fiber optic intubation may be useful when there is marked displacement of the larynx or coexisting difficulties with intubation, such as ankylosing spondylitis. A supraglottic airway device may be difficult to place in patients with laryngeal displacement. Tracheostomy under LA will only be possible if tracheostomy can be easily performed below the level of the obstruction. In a cannot intubate, cannot ventilate situation due to goiter size, Obstruction is slightly below the level of a cricothyroidotomy and ventilation through a rigid bronchoscope as a backup option should be attempted when attempts to pass the ETT fails. Next is maintenance. This is a shared airway surgery and patient's head is distant to the anesthetist. Ensure padding of the eyes, extra care if exophthalmos, provide eye lubrication, secure taping of the endotracheal tube, avoid ties around the neck. Access to check the endotracheal tube is difficult during the procedure. Be alert to airway dislodgement or tube compression. Communicate with surgeon if excessive airway pressures during manipulation of the trachea, as obstruction may be due to airway manipulation distal to the tube or the bevel of the tube abutting on the trachea. Head up tube to improve venous drainage, but not so as to impair arterial supply. Arms to the sides with extensions on fluid administration sets. Long breathing circuit for anesthetic machine. Monitor degree of muscle relaxation on the leg. Drugs. Maintenance of anesthesia is via IV or inhalational route. Remifentanil is useful to minimize the need for muscle relaxants and to achieve a degree of hypotension that will improve the surgical field. Tracheal manipulation during surgery can be very stimulating. Full relaxation or use of remifentanil prevents coughing during surgery. Electrophysiological monitoring of recurrent laryngeal nerves is common intraoperatively. Using specialized reinforced endotracheal tubes with EMG capability. When these are used, neuromuscular blockers should be avoided. Vasopressors such as phenylephrine may be useful to achieve normal tension towards the end of the surgery to test for hemostasis. There is high risk of nausea and vomiting, hence the need for antiemetics. Dexamethasone has added benefit of reducing airway edema. Post-op analgesia is important for blood pressure control. Intravenous morphine towards the end of surgery with regular paracetamol and NSAIDs if no contraindications. Oral morphine for breakthrough pain may be considered and is usually sufficient in addition to local anesthetic plus adrenaline infiltration by the surgeon. Superficial cervical plexus blocks may also be used. Thromboembolic prophylaxis with leg compression devices is indicated due to long surgery duration. Warming mattress, forced air warmer and warm fluids is indicated due to risk of hypothermia. Blood loss is usually minimal but can be major if retrosternal extension. Extubation. Assessment by the surgeon for tracheal malacia and recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy and extubation can be deferred if such complications have occurred. There is risk of failure of hemostasis. Use an extubation technique that minimizes coughing to reduce early secondary hemorrhage. Aim for smooth extubation. Remifentanil may be continued. Ensure analgesia is sufficient and extubate sitting up. Risk of laryngeal edema increases the risk of problems at extubation. Dexamethasone given intraoperatively reduces edema. Manage extubation in a standard manner, ensuring patient is sitting up, fully awake and fully reversed. Assess train of fall and provide appropriate dosing of neostigmine or sugamadex. Any respiratory difficulty should lead to immediate reintubation. Traditional practice of inspecting the vocal cords immediately following extubation is difficult and unreliable. Possible vocal cord dysfunction and post-op tracheal malacia is better assessed with the patient awake and sitting up in the recovery. C. Describe the specific post-op problems that may be associated with this operation. This includes failure of hemostasis, tracheal malacia, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, laryngeal edema, hypocalcemia, and pneumothorax. Failure of hemostasis. Resultant hematoma causes airway compression, necessitating removal of clips on the ward or urgent return to the theater. Patient presents with hemorrhage with tense swelling of the neck. 
Remove clips from the skin and sutures from the platysma or strap muscles to remove the cup. In extremis, this should be done at the bedside. Otherwise, return to the operation theatre without delay. A hematoma will affect lymphatic and venous drainage of the upper airway, causing laryngeal and pharyngeal edema. This leads to difficult intubation. Removing of the hematoma will not always restore airway patency immediately. IV dexamethasone and nebulized adrenaline may help acutely. Tracheomalacia is rare. Long-standing large goiters may cause tracheal collapse. Tracheomalacia not detected prior to the end of surgery causes airway obstruction, which necessitates immediate re-intubation and possible tracheostomy. Recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy can be difficult to detect on direct visualization prior to extubation. Uni or bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy may cause stridor and dyspnea. This may be assessed by fiber optic nasal endoscopy and may require tracheostomy. Unilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy may cause hoarse voice and difficulty for nating. Laryngeal edema has higher likelihood to occur after complex surgery or difficult airway management. Hypocalcemia is due to trauma or removal of parathyroid glands. Serum calcium levels should be checked at 24 hours and again daily if low. Hypocalcemia is rare and presents with signs of neuromuscular excitability, tingling around the mouth, tetany, fits, ventricular arrhythmias, carpopedal spasm, which may be precipitated by cuff inflation, also known as trosseal sign. Tapping over the facial nerve at the parotid may cause facial twitching, also known as chopstick sign. Prolonged QT may occur. Treatment of hypocalcemia is with oral calcium supplements if serum calcium levels is above 2 millimoles per litre, and IV calcium gluconate or calcium chloride if serum calcium levels are below 2 millimoles per litre. Pneumothorax may occur if retrosternal dissection has been necessary due to retrosternal extension of the goiter. Additional information Examiner's report The first and last parts of this question on pre-op test and post-op considerations were answered well. Majority of the marks were lost in the middle section on issues to be aware during anesthesia for elective thyroidectomy. Many candidates concentrated on management of thyroid storm or difficult airway, both of which are relatively rare during such surgery. It is likely that some candidates failed to read the question correctly because it was clearly stated that the patient was euthyroid, making thyroid storm very unlikely. Thyroidectomy The procedure involves removal of all or part of the thyroid gland. Duration is 1-2 to two hours depending on complexity. Pain is moderate. Position is with shoulder bolster and head ring with head up tilt. Blood loss is usually minimal unless retrosternal extension. Practical techniques include GAIPPV with reinforced endotracheal tube. Straightforward unilateral surgery can be performed under superficial or deep cervical plexus block, but GA is usual. Techniques for complicated thyroid surgery has been discussed in the previous section. Preoperative. Ensure that the patient is as near you thyroid as possible. Check for complications associated with hyperthyroidism such as AF, tachycardia and proptosis. Ask about duration of goiter as long-standing compression may lead to tracheomalacia. Check biopsy histology for malignancy and assess for the four M's of malignancy, mass effects, metabolic effects, effects of metastasis and medications. Ask about signs of compression, such as dyspnea, positional breathlessness, dysphagia, voice change and facial edema. Assess the airway and neck. Assess goiter size, consistency, lower border, tracheal deviation, signs of SVC obstruction, stridor, and range of neck movements. Acute preparation of thyrotoxic patients involves iodine and glucocorticoid. Both inhibit conversion of T4 to T3 and narrow the window to 7 to 10 days for surgery, consult endocrinologist. Pre-op paracetamol or NSAIDs may help post-op pain control. Continue beta blockade to reduce possibility of thyroid storm. Investigations has been discussed in the previous section. Intraoperative. Complexity can vary from removal of a thyroid nodule to removal of long-standing retrosternal goiter to relieve tracheal compression. 
Retrosternal goiters are usually excised through a standard incision, but occasionally a sternotomy is required. Recurrent laryngeal nerves and parathyroid glands may be damaged or removed in the process. Other details have been discussed in the previous section. Post-operative considerations. Intermittent opioids with oral or parectal PCM or NSAIDs should be adequate to control post-op pain. Opioid requirement is reduced with subcutaneous infiltration and superficial cervical plexus block. Use of fiber optic nasoendoscopy if there is doubt about recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. Thyroid storm. Clinical features. This is a severe life-threatening hyperthyroidism with evidence of decompensation in one or more organ systems. Mortality is 20 to 30 percent. Patients may present with fever, sweating, agitation, confusion, acute psychosis, coma, tachycardia, atrial fibrillation and heart failure, diarrhea and vomiting, acute abdominal pain, jaundice and hepatic dysfunction. Precipitating factors include infection, surgery, poorly prepared thyroid surgery, DKA, radioiodine therapy in a poorly prepared patient, trauma, myocardial infarction, amiodarone, labor and delivery. If presents intraoperatively, this may be difficult to distinguish from malignant hypothermia. There is higher mixed venous partial pressure of CO2 and higher CK in malignant hypothermia. Investigations. Take blood for FBC, BUS, creatinine, blood sugar, liver function tests, free T4 and TSH. Investigate for precipitants. Management. Mortality of untreated thyroid storm is high. If diagnosis is suspected, antithyroid treatment must be started prior to biochemical confirmation. Ideally, the patient should be managed in an intensive care unit. To treat the hyperthyroidism, propyl thiouracil and carbimazole may be used to inhibit thyroid hormone formation. PTU may be served orally or via nasogastric tube. Carbimazole is an alternative to PTU and may be served orally or via nasogastric tube. PTU may be preferable to carbimazole as it has the additional action of inhibiting peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. For patients who are unable to take medications orally, these drugs may be suspended in liquid and given rectally. Drugs that inhibit thyroid hormone release include sodium iodide, oral potassium iodide or oral lugol's iodine. Iodine should be given at least one hour after the patient has received the initial dose of PTU or carbimazole to ensure that iodine given is not taken up by the gland to further thyroid hormone synthesis and release. Steroids such as dexamethasone or hydrocortisone inhibits the release of thyroid hormones, inhibits peripheral conversion of T4 to T3 and is helpful to treat adrenal insufficiency. Beta-1 blockade by propanolol is used to treat tachycardia and beta-2 blockade by propanolol prevents the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. However, propanolol should not be used if there is pulmonary or peripheral edema, and if heart failure supervenes, atropine should be given. Dutizam can be used if beta blockade is contraindicated, such as in bronchial asthma. IV asmolol may be useful to allow rapid titration due to its short half-life. Beta blockade and calcium channel blockade should be avoided in heart failure. Cardiac failure is usually associated with fast atrial fibrillation. Drugs used to treat cardiac failure include diuretics, digoxin, and oxygen. Consider propanolol if cardiac failure is due to uncontrolled atrial fibrillation and left ventricular function is good. There is relative digoxin resistance with increased renal excretion and decreased action on AV conduction, hence higher dose of digoxin may be needed. Cardioversion of atrial fibrillation is very unlikely to be successful and should wait until the patient is euthyroid. Amiodarone may be useful when given parentally to control acute arrhythmias. Hyperparaxia is treated with fans, tepid sponging and paracetamol. Aspirin and NSAIDs should be avoided as they displace thyroid hormone from serum binding sites. Dehydration is treated with cautious replacement of fluids. Normal saline and glucose may be used. Anticoagulation by giving heparin is indicated for patients with atrial fibrillation. Other patients should receive subcutaneous heparin or low molecular weight heparin 
as prophylaxis against DVT. Remove or treat precipitating costs. Exchange transfusion or hemodialysis may be considered in patients who are resistant to pharmacological measures. Thank you.